Hello and welcome to another Hasselblad webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm Mark Whitney, part of Hasselblad European Marketing Team, and I'm coming to you today from my home in the UK. I'm also going to be joined by my colleague Chris Coos, who's Hasselblad's uh, Global Technical Communications Manager. Uh, Chris is also based in the UK, and Chris is going to be taking us through um, Focus 3.6 and the new Focus Mobile 2 1.2 versions. Um, it's designed to be for both uh, beginners and uh, experienced users. Uh, basically, Chris will be going through the new functionality just to let you know what's available and what's changed. Before I get to that, just uh, a few usual uh, notices. So past webinars are available on the Hasselblad YouTube channel. Uh, please feel free to visit there for any um, webinars we've done in the past. And also a recording of today's webinar will be posted on there within a few hours after the webinar or worst case tomorrow morning. Also, just a shout out about the Hasselblad Masters competition. Uh, it's still open for entries until the end of July. Uh, so if you haven't entered yet, uh, please go to the Hasselblad website. Um, it's open for all formats of camera. You don't have to have a Hasselblad camera to be able to enter. Uh, so please look at the full rules and regulations and hopefully um, you'll feel like you would like to submit your images to be in with a chance of winning. Also, um, just to announce a new style of webinar that we've got coming up next month, it's uh, going to be called Focus Q&A and it's uh, a webinar which will be, um, the content will be as suggested by the audience. So we're hoping to make it a regular thing where Chris, who's joining me today, will also present and basically when you register for the webinar, you're able to submit a question and what we'll do then is collate all of the questions and try to answer um, as many of those questions as possible during the webinar or try and categorize them into um, sort of topics and look to cover the most popular ones. Uh, and then if a question isn't answered, um, then hopefully you can then submit it again the next month and we'll eventually get around to it. And hopefully it will just be a good way of you learning more about focus and your workflow. So feel, please feel free to register for that on the Hasselblad website. So back to today's webinar, just a brief introduction. So, um, sorry, brief agenda. So we've got a brief introduction to the Focus family. Um, this is mainly just to summarize, again, the Focus apps for anyone that isn't familiar with them. It'll be very quick. So if you are experienced user, just stick with us. And then we'll get on to Focus updates, which will be the main uh, focus on today's uh, webinar. So Chris will be taking us through the updates to Focus Desktop 3.6 and also Focus Mobile 2 1.2. We estimate the running time of this to be around about 40 minutes. Um, but um, that should leave us some time at the end for some questions and answers. So please feel free to use the go to webinar control panel on the side there that you should have to submit any questions and we'll try to answer as many relevant questions either as we go or at the end of the webinar. So the focus family. So we've got three main uh, devices that we uh, cater for at the moment. So we've got focus desktop uh, that's available for Windows and Mac desktop PCs. Um, it's the all sing and all dancing version, basically. So full range of tools and functionality from importing images to editing them to exporting and also controlling your camera. This generally supports the full range of Hasselblad digital cameras and the connectivity is either Firewire or USB-C uh, tethering. Uh, this is uh, dependent on which camera you have. So obviously, if it's one of the newer X1D2s, uh, for example, it would be USB-C. Uh, but if looking to tether an H3D, for example, it will be through Firewire. Um, also, you can import through like a card reader as well by taking the card out of the camera and importing in. We then also got Focus Mobile, so that's available for iPad and iPhone. Um, it's a bit more limited in terms of functionality, uh, especially compared to the Focus desktop version, but it allows you to uh, review images as you shoot and also to control the camera remotely. Uh, that is um, compatible with all Wi-Fi enabled cameras. So, for example, the H5D 50C Wi-Fi and also the H60 and the X1D Mark I version. And uh, the only connectivity for that is Wi-Fi, hence why it's only compatible with those cameras. And then Focus Mobile 2 uh, for the iPad and the iPhone uh, works particularly well on the iPad Pro. Uh, so this is a little bit more uh, enhanced with import, capture, editing, export and camera control. This is available for the X1D2, the 907X and the 907X SE. Uh, we get a lot of questions asking why we don't support older cameras. Um, unfortunately, it's a hardware issue with the older cameras. Uh, the X1D2 was the first camera that was designed to work in association with Focus Mobile 2. 
So I'm afraid it just isn't possible for us to support cameras older than that. And that supports uh, USB-C tethering as well. So you're able to connect the camera directly to the iPad or the iPhone using a cable, uh, but you can also do it through Wi-Fi as well. So for full device compatibility and system requirements, um, have a look at hasabad.com forward slash focus. You should find everything on there in the readme files and um, they're all free to use. So even if you don't have a Hasselblad camera, you can download them and have a play. So let's go on to the main focus for today's webinar, which is obviously the updates to 3.6 and um, the Focus Mobile 2. So I'm just gonna throw over to Chris. So hi, Chris. Hi, Mark. I shall just uh, share my screen. There we go. Hopefully you should be able to see that. Yep. Okay. So hi everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, so we're going to spend a little time quickly on uh, Focus 3.6 for desktop. Let's go. So taking it in order. So the biggest uh, addition, should we say, to version 3.6 uh, is the tethered focus bracketing. Now we've had many, many requests for this from X users, H users. So uh, it's great that we've got this in there now working. Um, so H system cameras, basically H4D or later are compatible. Uh, even multi-shot cameras will work. Currently single shot and six shot is enabled. And obviously X system cameras, uh, the two X1Ds, so the original and Mark II, and the two versions of the 907X are supported. There's some subtle differences as we go through in terms of the uh, modes that are available. So we're just going to take a, a little time to review uh, where we are. So focus bracketing, uh, basic control. So if this is a quick screen grab, and I apologize for the quality there, of the capture sequencer. The focus bracketing tab has been added to that. Now, as you can see, some basic controls there in terms of live view controls, uh, focus controls in terms of step, uh, and more arrows, the bigger the step, and obviously frames and step size uh, within the menus, exactly the same as was on the cameras functionality that we added last year. So you've got your um, small steps all the way up to, to extra large. Now, just add that, sorry that. The newest uh, sweep mode that we've added to the system uh, is compatible with X1D, X1D, uh, sorry, X1D2 and the two 907s. Now, as I work through here, uh, the standard sweep modes that we had for last year, if you remember, uh, towards infinity, so where in this case, the camera would focus on my subject closest point, and then the camera, as we took the exposures, the images would step away towards infinity. For symmetric, uh, we would concentrate on the most important area of the subject. So imagine we were taking a picture of a watch or a ring, we would focus on the most important part of the subject there and then the camera would do a symmetric number of steps away and towards to ensure that we cover the subject accurately and then the third option that we added last year was the towards so again here we would focus on the furthest point that we needed in focus and then the camera would then take the images stepping towards close focus obviously if the step towards got too close and the camera couldn't focus any further, it would stop. So those are the three modes that we added last year and X1D series, 907s and H system cameras can utilize that. So new for 3.6 for the X1D2 and the 907 cameras is the specify limits function. Now with this, Specify limits is the sweep, and all we need to do is then set up our subject, focus on the closest point, 
or the furthest, whichever you want to do, whichever way round, it makes no difference. But in this case, closest point, and that would be through live view within the capture sequencer and using the zoom focusing tool within uh, focus, which we'll look at um, in, a, in a real life scenario a bit later on when we sh shift over to um, focus live. So in this case, I'd set the closest point and I would press the sweep limit one button and a distance, approximate distance would appear here. I then choose my furthest away point, get it into focus, and then I select my sweep limit two. And you would then see two distances and the system will automatically calculate how many frames it needs to take, taking into account your aperture, plus the step size that you've selected so that you have full subject coverage between those two points. That would then, as you would then go through the capture sequencer, press play, it would take 10 images, 20 images, and they're then numbered from first to last so that when you then export those images into your chosen software, be it Photoshop or Helicon Focus or whatever it, you, you were using, it makes it much easier for you to then uh, put the files into the correct order first to last. So very, very straightforward. Uh, nice little addition, but as I say, please note, only X1D2 and the 2907s can actually support this particular mode. H-System cameras and the original X1D can only use the three modes we added last year, which were basically the towards infinity, away, uh, towards close focus and the uh, symmetric from a center point. Okay, so obviously we will show you a, a live uh, version of this shortly. We're going to cover all of the updates in terms of a description first, and then we'll swap over to Focus Live. The next uh, new addition is an updated chromatic aberration tool. Now, as you all know, uh, the aberrations that you get from various lenses can give you a, a fringing effect, and normally extreme wide angles, high contrast uh, points right towards the edges of lenses is where we sometimes see them. And in terms of the standard corrections that we've applied for a long time, they're based on lens design and the aberrations, if you like, that we know are built into that design and we correct automatically for them. However, there are some uh, tolerances in terms of lens build and design. And so, Sometimes it doesn't get it perfect. So this adaptive option works on the basis of analyzing the image itself. And that opens up a whole new window for us to then allow correction for third party lenses, which obviously we don't have uh, the lens design information for, so we couldn't correct. So this means that even third party lenses, uh, you know, V system lenses and so on, you can have full uh, chromatic aberration correction for. So to cover this, just as a quick example, uh, this is a zoomed in portion of an image which was uh, displaying some chromatic aberration. Hopefully you can see here some uh, colored fringing here and on this side. So this is with all aberration corrections turned off. Turn on the standard correction and you can see it's done a pretty good job of removing that. But just to give you an example with the adaptive correction, you can see there's a lot more control of that color fringing has taken place. Okay. Uh, the third main tool that's been added is uh, a bit more of a creative tool. Um, normally we would spend a lot of time trying to minimize grain. Um, Sometimes there's no way around it, but there are times when we actually want to add the grain back as a more creative style effect. So we'll find this uh, in the tool section and we'll look again in a moment. Um, this tool, by the way, is not enabled by default. So you'll need to switch it on from the tool menu, which I'll show you when we go into focus. Basically, uh, within the type you have uh, different levels of grain, so standard, fine and soft. And then you have the controls here. I've got some basic examples here. So fine, soft and standard. 
just to give you an example of a comparison against everything switched off. And then granularity allows you to control the, the grain uh, size. Roughness gives you the control over the uh, perceived sharpness, how uh, hard are the edges on the grain. And then for color, when we've got color images, this allows us to introduce a little bit of color noise. Okay. Now, obviously, that's uh, adjustable to your own personal taste. You can create presets. And also, within the tool, Carsten and his team of software designers have given us some basic starting points for you to then create your own presets beyond there. So we'll look at those options when we work through. So that's a quick overview of the tool. So I'm now going to switch to uh, the Focus desktop app itself. Chris, just while you do that, um, yep. we've got a couple of questions regarding compatibility with focus bracketing. So oh, okay. uh, a couple of questions um, about H lenses and focus bracketing. So if you were to use them on the X1D with the adapter, is that an option? Yes, it is. Uh, the, the most important fact basically is the H lens must be able to autofocus with an X camera. So whether you're using the uh, XH adapter, the plain one, uh, or the XH uh, 0.8 converter, as long as the lens can autofocus, it's fine. You can use the uh, focus bracketing function. Okay, and uh, Philo is asking about the HTS as well. Um, it's not possible with HTS, is that right? Well, you can uh, put all of these converters on. The only problem that we've got in terms the step size information is based on the straight lens. So you'll just have to spend a little bit of extra time working on uh, which step size works for what you're trying to do. Because obviously with the HTS, you get the one and a half times focal length increase. So you know your depth of field is going to decrease by the same amount. And so therefore, you're probably going to need to use a slightly bigger step size than you would have thought, uh, to, to a finer step size, sorry, so that you can actually capture everything. So again, as I say, it's more of a, a little bit more of a trial and error when you use those accessories to work out exactly what step size works for you. Okay. Okay, great. I'll let you crack on. Okay. I'll just go over to focus. So I'm connected here to my X1D and just to show the basic functionality, I've got a X1D set up to photograph, uh, in this case, a V-System camera. As you can see here, the capture sequencer, if I just float that tool. So I've got my focus step tools here. I've got my four options there. And today we'll use the specify limits. Uh, I'm going to leave it on the medium because that seems to work quite well for what I'm shooting here. And then obviously the number of frames is calculated automatically by the system. So I'm going to go to live view. And then there's my camera in terms of just focused on the basic body area here. And now what I will do, I'm going to focus on, let's just basically put that back in the, out of the way, otherwise we'll get confused. So now I'm going to focus on the closest point, which is the edge of this lens. And it looks like we're too far away, so I can, just there we go pretty good and then too far so i'll come back up that looks pretty good so i'm going to set the sweep limit and that's given me a 0.6 of a meter and now i will focus on an area towards the back of the camera
and that looks pretty good. So 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 basically. The system will automatically now work out the number of frames and all I need to do is start it. In this case, it says there's 17 frames needed. And as you can see, the frames are automatically added, uh, date order, and then shooting order, which makes it very, very easy then when I export the files to then put them into my chosen software. I know the order, I can just tell the software, there they are, stack, simple as that. Won't take too long. So really, really simple, takes the hassle out of trying to work out how many frames. Uh, and again, you can modify the step size to, to suit your requirements. Obviously, if you want it to have a finer step, uh, you can do that, just choose small. I wouldn't recommend extra small unless it was you know, ultra fine detail you're looking for, or maybe you know, a ring or a watch or something like that. Uh, and again, if you're shooting outdoor landscapes and so on, and you're trying to get close to far, um, again, specify limits will let you do that, but you could probably get away with a, a large uh, step for that if you're using a wide angle lens. So very, very straightforward, a nice little addition to the three different modes that we had already anyway. Um, and nice that it's now through the tethered. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is show you the chromatic aberration tool. So please excuse me while I just bring this up. Lens correction. So by default, this is zero uh, chromatic aberration. And in this case, I know that this particular image, we've got this really high contrast area down here. So if I was to uh, move in here, Can see that and uh, what I'll do is just zoom up a little bit Maybe that's slightly too far hopefully you can see that there is still um, some aberration showing there and if I put the standard aberration on it does a pretty good job but if I now move to adaptive you can see a lot closer it's fully corrected that very very quickly So that's the addition. Now, the most important thing to remember there, um, with the lens corrections, if I was to move to uh, a lens that's not Hasselblad, so if you just bear with me one second, this was obviously taken on a, a large uh, format technical camera. So from our uh, perspective, this particular uh, lens is unknown. So if you look here, I've got all of the V system lenses, X pan lenses, and then other. So whenever we're dealing with third party, I still have now the adaptive option. So if required, I, I would be shocked if any of this actually needed to be corrected, to be honest. Uh, but I just wanted to show you the other option. Um, so third party lenses, use the other option, it will physically assess the uh, image area and create a chromatic aberration correction if required. If we were using uh, a V system lens, here I have the option of all three once I've selected the lens and obviously the shooting characteristics as best as you can remember them in terms of uh, distance and so on. So in this case, it will be infinity about F11, and, th and that would be the correction. But again, with a V-system lens or an X-pan lens, I then have the option of standard or adaptive. So that's the chromatic aberration. Okay, that's cool. And now what I'll do is I'll go to the film grain tool.
So this particular shot, uh, it obviously is Venice. A lot of flat areas here, some dark shadows. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just quickly zoom in a little bit. So there's some areas here which will show up the grain effects very, very well. Now, normally, film grain is not enabled. So you will have to come up to here and load the tool. Obviously, I've been using it to do some tests, so it's now uh, in my default tool list. So if I switch on the film grain tool, we're probably going to need to zoom in one more. And then I've got three settings here. So if I go with standard, and then I can increase the amount, increase the granularity so that you can actually see it, and the sharpness of the grain. Okay, so you can see the type of effect that we'll get here. So again, fantastic for adding creative effects. And obviously the software team here have given us you know, six or seven starting points. So if I go to find texture, it gives me some basic settings here to then modify to my heart's content. Artistic, well, obviously this is a starting point. If I thought, oh, that's a bit too much, I could then reduce the roughness, probably knock back the granularity a little bit, a bit happier with that. If I like that, I can then create a preset, give it a name, create. Now, when I go to the list, my personal presets are down here in addition to the standard list. Simple as that to add a new uh, preset. And obviously that works with all of the other tools. So if I wanted to make that a grayscale tool uh, setting there, I could do that. And if I just zoom back out so you can see a bit more of the image, and then as I adjust the image to my heart's content, I can then say, okay, this black and white needs a bit more so I could increase the roughness. And just to, so you can actually see it. Again, great little creative tool, very simple to use. And then as you find uh, settings that uh, you like, as I say, you can then just add presets in to build up along here. Okay. So that's the basic tools there, Mark, in 3.6 that we've added. Okay, yeah, great, thank you very much. Um, so not really any specific questions um, about um, the updates that we're talking about. Um, so um, yeah, Shall I, I think on? one thing I, I think uh, to add is obviously um, with regards to stacking the images uh, that you shot using focus bracketing, uh, we've got a, another webinar, complete um, webinar on the whole subject of focus bracketing. Um, so that's obviously a place to go if you'd like more information about how to then use those images, like whether it's Photoshop or Helicon Focus. Uh, so uh, any questions or queries, uh, try looking at that webinar because that should hopefully answer them. Uh, and then also with regards to film uh, grain, um, obviously I think it's it's there mainly for artistic um, impressions, is that right? Yep. Yeah, I mean, we, we normally spend a lot of time to minimise grain, shall we say, uh, in captures, uh, but this is purely an artistic tool to to uh, enable you to you know, adjust your image to have a, a pleasing creative effect, let's put it that way. OK, so I understand uh, you're now going to switch to the uh... Focus Mobile 2. Um, yeah, I think so. uh, well, I'll, I'll switch over to Focus Mobile 2. Um, just, just to conclude that first round, I'd say, obviously the tethered uh, focus bracketing is the, the main addition here. 
and the big change is that the H system cameras and H system lenses have been added in so that we can actually utilize that tool. Uh, X system cameras obviously had that within camera last year. Unfortunately, uh, we can't, because of the hardware restrictions, add that camera functionality to H, which is why it had to wait for the tethered uh, desktop shooting scenario. Um, but obviously for X users, there's been a lot of feedback they wanted tethered as well. Plus, they've asked uh, for the specify limits. And again, unfortunately, we, we can't add that at the moment to the H system because of a hardware restraint. So only the X1D2 and the 2907s can access that new specify limits mode. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, I'll swap over, Mark, while you... Just while uh, Chris is um, swapping over, he needs to um, reconnect the camera to focus mobile. Um, we've just got a little bit of a poll. Uh, so now that you've uh, seen some of the updates uh, for de desktop focus, uh, we just wondered um, which of them would you find most helpful um, in your workflow? Uh, just be interesting to get some feedback as to which ones you think you might be able to um, add into your workflow. Okay, so it looks like there's a lot of love for the, the focus bracketing, which is good. And all of them in general as well, which is which is good. Okay, how are you getting on, Chris? Yeah, just waiting for the Wi-Fi to connect and we'll be done. Okay, so let's close the poll there and I'll share the results with you all. Okay. Um, yeah, so as I say, a lot of love for the inbuilt focus bracketing, which is good. And 24% um, of you would use them all, which is which is good. Okay. And you should now be able to see everything. Yes, there we go. So it's just searching for the camera. And while it's doing that, I will just quickly move on to the Focus Mobile presentation. Hopefully you can see that, Mark. Yep, all good. So uh, version 1.2 for iPad. Couple of big changes, I suppose. Uh, we've been asked for quite a while now, I want to be able to save to card and camera simultaneously. So we've added that functionality. Obviously it works much faster if you're shooting tethered uh, to your iPad from your camera. And if we go to the camera menu, very, very straightforward. I'll show you this live in a moment. Previously you had on this device or on this camera, now you just click both. And then as you shoot, be it uh, raw files, safe to the camera uh, will be a fraction of a second before, because obviously there's a transfer time, and then it will appear on the iPad ready for you to edit. So you've got an automatic backup as you shoot. So very, very straightforward. The second main tool that's been added is the defringe tool. Now, obviously this was uh, within the desktop app for quite a while now. Uh, but as you're now editing the raw files on your iPad, it's quite useful for this one, especially where you're shooting high contrast images. Uh, you'll get that uh, purple, bluish fringing sometimes, especially in the really, really high contrast, small detail areas. So as per the desktop app, the defringe tool is there. Uh, when you activate the, the dropper here, the circle will appear and you can drag this around to the area that needs correcting and, and we will do that on a live image in a moment and then the system will automatically calculate the required correction if you're not happy or if you feel it's too too strong or too weak obviously you have a manual override here uh, or you can just increase or decrease the range but the first off uh, automatic correction is basically click the dropper click the image and then 
these sliders will move based on the correction calculated. JPEG editing. Now, when you're out in the field and you're shooting away your JPEGs, they're fully processed in-camera images, but obviously there are times when you want to tweak them in terms of color balance, basic exposure values, and so on. So you now have the option uh, to connect to your iPad, and you can then see in, your, in the camera uh, view all of the JPEGs that you've shot. If you select a file, so the thumbnails will appear along here. So you select a file and then to edit it, all you need to do is then press the download button. You'll see a small um, uh, transfer box come up. That's the file being transferred across to the iPad, the full uh, JPEG file. And again, depending on whether you're shooting wired or wireless, depends on how fast that transfer will take place. And then your image will appear and it will be on the iPad itself. When you then select that image and you go into the tools, obviously your normal tools alongside here. So just to give you an example, this is the exposure tool. And you can see EV, contrast, brightness, all enabled. So anything that has a white dot is enabled. So curves obviously will be available, but there are certain tools which are specifically for raw adjustments. Uh, so that would be things like recovery, shadow fill, um, the, the defringe tool and so on. That's specifically designed to work with a raw file. Um, so where they're grayed out like this, unfortunately, they're not available to you as an editing of the JPEG, but there's a vast majority of the tools for basic exposure, curves and so on they are available to you. And obviously the cropping tool and so on, and then export is fully available to you there as well. Okay, so I'll now swap to the iPad. Give me one second, Mark. So here you can see my iPad screen. Uh, it's just trying to connect to the X1D. Unfortunately, uh, this is, yes, there we go. You can't see me obviously pressing the keys on the iPad, just the screen display, I'm sorry. Uh, we need more cameras, but uh, so if I then select an image in the album, I can then move along my thumbnails and then I have my editing tools along here. Now obviously the defringe tool which we've just talked about if I was to just go back to a specific image let's take one of these if I go to the lens correction tool here you can see the defringe and if I zoom right in here, you can see that we've got some chromatic aberration in this highlight area here. I've had to zoom in quite considerably, but if I now hit the defringe tool, I can drag that across to here and allow the system to correct. And there we go. Simple as that. If I'm not happy with that, I could then adjust the slider to take out more or less. And I can also change the ranges, obviously, to adjust that to my requirements. So really straightforward in this case for that particular tool. If I now go to the camera, as you can see, within the camera menu, you've got the two options that were previously there and obviously the both. Done. Okay. 
in terms of JPEG editing, when you're uh, untethered, you can select JPEG in the camera uh, quality menu. Then as you shoot your, your full-size JPEGs, when you then connect uh, to the camera, you'll be able to see, if I select, select this image, uh, I know that this was a, a JPEG. Uh, if you want to be sure of what images you're looking at, obviously you can go to the view menu and then just ask to see the JPEG only. Just to prove that it's true. 3FR is just that, those two images there. So in this case, I choose JPEG, select that image, and then there's my download button here. I can click download. That's now transferred to the iPad. And if I go back to the album, there's my frames. So if I click on that, I can now edit that file. And as before, that one's obviously, a, let's just show JPEGs only, that one. So as you can see, for JPEG files, these are not available. I go to the color correction. I still have the ability to uh, switch it on. Grayscale image, I've got uh, tint corrections, saturation, vibrancy, but obviously lens correction, I can't do the defringe tool. And the actual lens corrections are, are grayed out because obviously they've already been applied in the camera. Zoom works as exactly the same before in terms of zoom functionality. Uh, and then once I'm happy, I then have the option to export full size, uh, medium size with the corrections that I've done. Okay. One little addition to uh, the 1.2 update, which is a little bit difficult to show. Basically, they've enhanced the speed of the correction between, if I change a setting on the camera, how uh, quick does the iPad update to reflect that? And if I change, let's say, a, a white balance setting on the iPad, that's very quickly then uh, replicated on the camera so that the camera and the iPad match in terms of the settings. So just a little enhancement there. So that's most of the corrections there, Mark. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, we didn't really have too many questions regarding Focus Mobile 2. Um, there's a little bit of confusion um, over some of the compatibility um, okay. that we talked about. So maybe we can go over that again, just to, to repeat that and to confirm certain combinations. Sure. So with regards to um, some of the older cameras uh, using some of these features, obviously it's hardware limitations. Um, are we able to give any more information exactly what that limitation is? Do you know what that is? Well, effectively the H4D, H5D, H6, because obviously this uh, tethered focus bracketing only works from H4D onwards. And so that is basically uh, the, the control of uh, the lens system and so on through the H camera. So it's a hardware, a physical electronic platform issue. So only from H4D onwards can we then uh, control the steps correctly. Um, and again, we also need to make sure the H lenses that you're shooting with must be on the very latest lens firmware and obviously camera body firmware to make sure that they're fully up to date. A lot of the really uh, old lenses, so 2002, 2008 type scenario, very early lenses, they couldn't physically be updated anyway to autofocus with an X camera. And so in that particular case, we couldn't use those lenses with the adapters on an X camera. So H cameras, H4D to modern day, if your lens is up to date, camera's up to date, you should have no problem using the three standard uh, focus bracketing functions. If you then want to use your 
H system lenses with an X camera. You can do that, but they must be able to autofocus with one of the uh, X system adapters. So that could be the XH adapter, which is just a straight plane converter uh, con connector, or the XH converter 0 0.8, which we bought out last year. Either of those two, the lens must be able to autofocus with the cam X camera body or the 907X camera body to enable you to use this function. Hmm. And then finally, the final combination, if like is the new mode, so the specify limits, unfortunately, is only available for X1D2 and the two 907X cameras. Um, and again, that's down to a hardware limitation. Uh, We've not been able to get past that at this point. Um, so it's only really uh, new camera owners that are going to be able to use that specify limits. But obviously the other three modes are very, very good. And for H users, this is the first time they've had access to that uh, bracketing functionality, it, albeit through tethered. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's worth you know stressing that Hasselblad always sort of pride themselves on backwards compatibility where possible. You know, we do the adapters for the older lenses, uh, but unfortunately, the way that technology moves on, um, some of this backwards compatibility isn't always possible. Um, but, you know, it's it's not a case of us holding back, uh, in, you know, to, to try and push people towards buying new cameras. It's it's just just not physically possible with the hardware that those cameras have. So, uh, unfortunately, some of the new technology when it comes along will only be supported by some of the newer cameras. Um, yep. so, yeah, OK. Um, I had a question from Jeffrey. Um, can you use the new grain um, tool, film, the film grain tool, um, in only certain sections? So can you use it with adjustment masks and layers? Uh, at this point, it is only uh, a global tool. Just okay. close that down, Mark, and then I can fire focus back up yeah so at this point basically uh it's a global tool it's a new tool um i think if there was enough call for it carsten could add it as an, an adjustment layer or a, a tool within the adjustment layers uh but at this point it's a global image correction only okay yeah um so yeah not supported at the moment but could be in the future so we'll feed that back to the team yep um a question from ernest um, can you use um, focus bracketing with the multi-shot camera? Yeah. Yes, you can. At this point, single shot and six shot are working. Uh, I know Carsten and his software team are hoping to add the, the, the four shot, but as of today, it's the single shot and six shot only. Okay. Um, a question from Robert. Um, are you able to um, shoot with electronic shutter with focus bracketing? Do you know, that's a very good question. Uh, and I'll have to come back to Robert on that one because that is one function I've not tested. OK, and you've stumped Chris on that one, so congratulations. There's <laughs> not much he doesn't know, but yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, let me just have a quick look through the questions. Uh, while I just uh, catch up with the questions, we've got quite a few coming in. Um, yep. I'll just launch another poll, if that's okay, just to see which of the um, Focus 2 updates people would find most helpful. Obviously, the people that, that use this, this piece of software. Yep. So, okay, let's close that and show the results there. So again, um, good to see that most of the, or well, all of the um, updates are useful um, and specifically the, the uh, capture into both the device and the ST card simultaneously, uh, which is good. So thanks Excellent. very much for that. Um, so a lot of the questions coming in really are quite specific um, to user experiences, um, different combinations of devices and cameras and 
lenses um, obviously there's lots of different permutations and combinations to the systems that people use um, so what we'll try and do we'll try and uh, rather than answer them here when they're quite specific we'll try and get back to individuals um, just to answer their questions um, in the next few days um, if that's all right with you Chris and yep, that's um, perfect. We'll, we'll try to um, yeah try to help as many of you as possible and um, yeah I think uh, that's pretty much done for the subject I think uh, thank you Chris no problem thanks very much okay so if I just wrestle back the um, the presenting um, duties yep. uh, do that? okay there we go So just to finish up, just another reminder that the focus Q&A webinar that we've got coming up on the 16th of June. So this will be a general uh, focus webinar where you can submit your questions that you would like to be covered um, and when you register for the webinar. And then we'll look to choose the most popular questions and topics and cover as many as possible in the time permitted. And um, we're hoping to make this a regular thing. Um, so if your answer, uh, sorry, if your question doesn't get answered in the first, Q&A webinar, then hopefully you can submit it again uh, for future consideration for the next one. So please feel free to register for that on the Hasselbad website. Also, when you exit the webinar, a webinar feedback form should come up. Um, it would be really much appreciated if you could give us some feedback on there, you know, what we're doing good, what we're doing bad, and um, what you would like to see more of with uh, our webinars in the future. And another reminder that the webinar has been recorded today. So if there's any parts you would like to go back and watch again, uh, we'll upload a recording to the Hasselbad YouTube channel um, either tonight or worst case tomorrow morning. Um, so feel free to have a look on there. And any other webinars, um, like we mentioned, the, the one dedicated to focus bracketing, uh, you'll be able to find that on our YouTube channel as well. And then finally, for more Hasselblad information, of course, Hasselblad.com, our website, everything on there from future webinars and events, our products, our partner network around the world, uh, inspirational stories and images, uh, lots on our history. Uh, you can of course request a demo as well from your local partner and, uh, and ask for any support that you may need on any products. Just to cut in there, Mark, uh, the answer to yep. that question is yes, you can use electronic shutter with the focus uh, uh, bracketing function. Okay, great. There we go. <laughs> Not to be outdone. Uh, Chris has answered it. <laughs> okay, great. So thank you very much, Chris. And um, I'll say hopefully see you all again on another webinar soon. Thank you very much.